Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, give us understanding today of your truth, your word. Draw us to yourself. Open up our hearts and minds to receive from you today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have you ever sat in a Bible class and listened and all of a sudden a question just pops into your mind? And you want to ask it, but you're, you're kind of afraid that if you ask it, everyone there will know that you don't have all the answers and, and that it might sound kind of dumb and you're not as smart as you, everybody knows you're not quite as smart as you really thought you were. We tell our kids that there are no dumb questions, but as adults, we don't really act like that. Even as adults, we sometimes become very self-conscious about asking questions. And so we, we begin to look around and, and just waiting for someone else to raise their hand and, and hopefully ask our question. And before you know it, though, class is over and our question never gets asked. So what do we do? Well, if you're like me, you just text Sue Steggy after class. Uh, one of the things that, that happens when we have opportunities to go to class, hopefully together, and hopefully you're going to join us for class right after this, one of the things that happen when we go to classes is, is we get sort of excited uh, learning a little bit more about God and his word, and, and we were filled with anticipation to what we might learn, what we might ask. And hopefully, in fact, we're going to give you an opportunity in just a little bit to share what you're excited and filled with anticipation to learn uh, through this time of this COVID crisis, and, and maybe what's exciting you that you see God doing in this time, and and if you have some questions you want answered, you can ask those in chat. We probably won't get to them after the service, but we'll get to them eventually. The reason I, I'm talking about asking questions is because of all the church festivals, the Festival of the Ascension probably fills us with a lot of questions, and we want to ask them, but we're a little nervous about it. I mean, why is the Ascension even important? Does it matter for me today as a follower of Christ? The disciples certainly had a lot of questions about this, and, and Jesus had just told them he's about to go back to heaven. This is what he said. He said, so when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They didn't understand what was going on. All they knew is they were happy that Jesus was alive, and they were eager to hear him speak, and, and they had a lot of questions they wanted to ask him, and they didn't care how they sounded. They didn't care how dumb it made them look. They're going to ask Jesus their questions before he leaves to go back to heaven. And if the Lord's going to depart, now's the time to ask. And, and their main question was, yeah, are you going to come and set up the kingdom? But God had a much bigger plan like he always does. Well, so to help us understand the ascension, what it means for us, we're going to look at a timeline from a holy week to his resurrection and then to his ascension, maybe just a little bit beyond. In John chapter 19, as Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. Everything that needed to be done for the redemption of man had been completed. His work of salvation was finished. He had paid for the sins of the whole world. Nothing else needed to be done. His sacrifice, his death on the cross was the only punishment God demanded for the sins of man. And what that means is that every sin, every mistake you or I have ever committed or will ever commit has been paid for by the death of of the Holy Son of God. He, he shed his blood and gave his life so we would be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead to give us the assurance that death has been defeated and we have eternal life. Now, I, I want you to be confident. I want you to really know he died as he hung on the cross. In fact, John 19 goes on to say, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed, a sure sign of death. And then they pulled them from the cross and laid them in a tomb. And then three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And over a period of 40 days, 
appeared to many, many people, including his disciples. And the reason Jesus took this 40-day period to appear to many disciples was, first of all, to convince his disciples that he has physically resurrected from the dead. In fact, Acts 1 says, to these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. In fact, his disciples were so convinced that Jesus has, has died and risen from the dead that the book of Acts records how they devoted the rest of their lives telling the world about Jesus. Secondly, it was 40 days to, to spend time teaching his disciples. Luke tells us, Jesus saying, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I love that verse. That's so exciting. Now you would think if Jesus opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, they wouldn't have any questions, but I guess it's true, the more you know, the more questions you have. And then Jesus said to them, you are my witnesses of these things. Jesus taught them, Jesus taught them so that they would go and teach others, that they were to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing and teaching them all that he had commanded them. But even though Jesus called them to do that. They were not to go until they had received the promised Holy Spirit, whom Jesus needed to return to heaven so they could send the Spirit forth. And the third thing, Jesus took this 40 days to correct their thinking. If you read the Gospels carefully, Jesus spent a lot of his time helping the disciples unlearn all the wrong things that they learned from their religious leaders. And then relearning the truth of God in his word. And, and so, for example, Jesus said a lot of things like, like, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Well, before Jesus left, he instructed them, and, and they're asking, well, are you going to set the kingdom? And their question reveals that they had a wrong understanding. They knew that Jesus was going to come set up a kingdom, and so they asked, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? The problem was not that their thinking was wrong, but their focus was off. Instead of looking for Jesus to establish his earthly kingdom, Jesus was trying to teach them that they needed to look at other people. Instead of focusing on the kingdom, they needed to focus on people who weren't yet a part of that kingdom. Notice Jesus isn't dealing with their understanding of his kingdom. He's dealing with their understanding of the timing of his kingdom. Don't be mistaken. There's going to come a day when Jesus will return and set up his earthly kingdom. But for now, Jesus wanted the disciples to focus on those who weren't yet a part of that kingdom so that they too may become part of his forever family. In other words, Jesus was after their heart. He'd opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, but he needed their heart to follow. He wanted them to look at people, not at the kingdom. Now, today, a lot of people get caught up in this excitement of the end times I, I, in his coming kingdom. I, I have a lot of people right now with all this coronavirus asking me, is this a sign of the end times? Is this a sign of Jesus' return? You know, books and articles about end times are always so exciting and popular as long as they're scary. But the return of Christ isn't going to be scary at all for believers. The problem is that some people get so busy looking for the signs of Christ's return that they forget what God has called us to do. They forget that we are to carry the message of the hope of the gospel to the world. God has called us to connect people to Jesus. That's our focus. We aren't to point people to the signs of Christ's return. We are to point to Jesus. That's why Jesus said, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. 
when Jesus ascended back to heaven, he would send forth his Holy Spirit to empower and equip his disciples to share the hope of Jesus, to share the good news. That was to be their focus. Beloved, the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples before he returned to heaven were not words about the end times. They were words about sharing the gospel. They weren't words about his return or his coming kingdom. They were about his present kingdom and our responsibility in it. Then Jesus was taken up to heaven. The ascension of Jesus was a glorious event. In verse 11, we are told, in verse 11, we are told that Jesus is going to return the same way in, in which he went. And just as they saw him being taken up into heaven, we're going to see him when he returns. It's going to be visible for all to see. And the ascension of Jesus was the final incontestable evidence that Jesus was who he claimed to be and that he was the victor over this devil and death, that he's defeated the power of sin and death and the devil, and that the Father has accepted his sacrifice as the payment for our sins. The ascension has great meaning for us today. It means, first of all, that this, there's separation, but there's not sadness. Jesus physically left his followers. But we don't find them in mourning or in sadness because the ascension means a, a greater intimacy now with God. Notice, uh, Jesus returned to heaven and, and he sent the Holy Spirit that was promised. Jesus said in Luke 24, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay until the city, until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus said, that he would be with us always, even to the very end of the age. And that even though Jesus is physically gone, that he would be present with them by the power of the Holy Spirit. There was not sadness or tears, but joy and excitement. There was great anticipation. The ascension means acceptance by the Father. It reveals that the work which Jesus was sent to accomplish was not only completed, but completely accepted by the Father in heaven. Hebrews chapter 1 says, when he had made justification, when, when he'd made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. And now that Jesus has ascended, he is now clothed in glory. When Jesus returned to his heavenly home, it was in splendor and glory. Philippians 2 says, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name. Now, what is so exciting about this is what John would say. He said, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. That's exciting. The fourth thing the ascension means for us is this confirmation of Christ's personal work. When Jesus returned to the Father, his claim to have come from the Father was proven to be true. His ascension was visible to his followers and served as confirmation of all he said and taught and did. Hebrews chapter 6 says, This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. And one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered is the forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, Jesus is an anchor of our faith because he is like the priest of old, the high priest who, who made uh, atonement for the sins on behalf of the people, only Jesus was real. He, he was the lamb. And his sacrifice was so good that as a high priest, he can now be seated at the Father's right hand, where now Jesus continues to serve not by not offering sacrifices, but is a mediator between us and God. He, he, Romans 8 says he is interceding for us. The fifth thing it means is that the ascension was a time of transition. The ascension is a link between the saving work of Christ and what God now has called us to do. Jesus said, 
But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. All God's promises are true. And, and so this time between his resurrection and the ascension became a time of waiting, a time of anticipation for that promise to be fulfilled when we would be empowered to do what God called us to do. And that's what it was. The ascension was a time of great anticipation. It, it carries a sense of excitement in us. First of all, we know that Jesus will return one day, just as he departed. The angels in Acts 1 says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. It's exciting. It fills us with this anticipation to know that one day, one day, Jesus is going to return and take us from this world of, uh, of sorrow and struggles. He's going to return the exact same way he left, returning in the clouds, First Thessalonians says, and he will come to take us to paradise. Secondly, it's exciting because we know that, that his word is completely true and trustworthy. Everything, everything happened exactly as he said it would. So we trust everything is going to happen just as he promises it will happen. What I love about this is, is, is the church, the, the disciples, actually 120 people in Acts chapter 1, 120 people had gathered together in prayer and anticipation, waiting for the promise. Beloved, the ascension is not to be seen as a conclusion to Jesus' life and ministry. Rather, it is the beginning of a new ministry through his body, the church. Jesus and his disciples gathering, uh, Jesus had his disciples gather together and pray and seek him until it was time. God always has, always will work through his church. He empowers his church, his body on earth. And so we gather together with great anticipation for the future of what God wants to do in and through us as his body, the church. And the ascension gives us the assurance of his presence and power in these days until he returns. That should fill us with great excitement and anticipation. And so, beloved, that's what we want to know from you. What is it that fills you with excitement and anticipation that you see God doing in these days? What is it that you are longing for, waiting for, excited about? I'm going to leave you with one last verse from 2 Corinthians. For as many as the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. God is working. He's made promises. We're just going to say amen, Lord Jesus. Amen.